Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit subscribe for more great true crime content. If you would like to support Indie Drop-In and get these episodes ad-free, check out our Patreon at the bottom of the show notes. Today's episode is from Mask of Sanity. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. Look deeper. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the show. I hope you're all doing well and perhaps finding moments of levity throughout the day. Maybe listening to my episode is yours. Who knows? I hope so. I'm your host, Melanie Peterson, and for today's case, we are going to talk about the Black Widower, Robert Spangler. Spangler brutally murdered his wife and two teenage children on December 30th, 1978, so that he could marry his mistress, Sharon Cooper. His marriage to Cooper ended in a very messy divorce, and Sharon would sadly accidentally overdose in 1993. The death of his third wife, Donna Sundling, in 1994 is what finally put Spangler on the police's radar. They had been hiking in the Grand Canyon when Spangler claimed his wife fell off a cliff, plummeting nearly 140 feet down. Police had suspected him in the deaths of his first family, but unfortunately they had no clear-cut evidence to charge him because the crime scene was made to look like it was actually his wife who had murdered their children before turning the gun on herself. So with another suspicious death on their hands, they began to look closer at Robert Spangler. It wouldn't be until late 2000 when this man, this man that neighbors considered a good guy, this man who was active in the community, the kind of neighbor you want to live next to, actually confessed to being a cold-blooded killer when he was diagnosed with brain cancer and knew his time was running out. Buckle up, my friends. This one is going to be a bumpy ride. This is Mask of Sanity. Robert Spangler was born in Des Moines, Iowa on January 10, 1933, but was given up for adoption when he was just a baby. His adoptive parents, Merlin and Iona, raised him in Ames, Iowa, and for the most part, he had a pretty normal childhood. Before he would go on to savagely kill two of his wives and his two children, Robert Spangler was suspected of murdering a classmate that he reportedly didn't like when he was just 11 years old. Aside from the mysterious death of his classmate, Robert moved through his teen years, as many of us do. He was a star player on the football team, and upon graduation, he enrolled at Iowa State University in 1951. He graduated from college with a degree in technical journalism, and that same year, he married Nancy Stallman. The couple soon moved to Denver, and after six years of marriage, they welcomed their first child, David, born on November 27, 1961. A daughter, Susan, was born on August 14, 1963, but familial bliss would only last for so long. Robert began having an affair with a woman he worked with while an employee at American Water Works, and her name was Sharon Cooper. He was 43 years old at the time, and the affair with Sharon lasted for about two years. At one point, he moved out of his home and stayed with Sharon, but eventually moved back in with his family in October 1978. Sadly, over the holidays in December of that year, Robert Spangler would murder his wife and his two children at their home in Littleton, Colorado. At approximately 10.30 a.m. on December 30th, 1978, Susan Spangler's boyfriend drove over to the Spangler residence to pick up his girlfriend. After getting no answer when he knocked on the door and not hearing any movement inside, he grew concerned because he knew that not only was Susan home, but also her brother and her mother, and it wasn't like them to not answer the door. Susan knew he was coming over, and it just 
really confused Timothy. He looked through the windows to see if anyone was inside, and his heart sunk a little when there was no movement. So he began to get a bit worried about the Spangler family. He did consider, however, that maybe they were all sleeping, they slept through their alarms for whatever reason, they couldn't hear him knocking, but the longer time went on and there was no answer at the door, Timothy grew more and more concerned. So finally, he entered the home and came face to face with a horrifying scene. Both Susan and David were lying on the floor dead from gunshot wounds. Robert was nowhere to be found, and once the police arrived on the scene, they began searching the home, eventually going down into the basement and discovering Nancy Spangler dead from a gunshot wound to the head. The gun and a typewritten suicide note were found nearby. Not long after, Robert returned to the home to find sheriff deputies everywhere. He allegedly claimed initially that he was at the movies and was so shocked at the deaths of his beloved family. But let's just hold up a hot second there. You're telling me that the best alibi this guy could think up was going to the movies on a Saturday morning alone. He later told police that he and Nancy were having marital problems and that he was planning on leaving her. On the morning of December 30th, he also told them that he had left early and went to work for a bit. So right here, he's changing his story. He allegedly said the first time that he was questioned that he went to the movies. Now he's saying he went to work for a bit. And a year after the murders, when he was asked about all of this again, he said that, quote, he returned home and found his wife sitting in a chair with a gunshot wound to the head. He said he saw the gun nearby and handled it, end quote, which conveniently explained why he had gunshot residue on his right hand. Spangler also took at least one polygraph and, quote, two separate private polygraph examiners found his answers inconclusive to questions about his role in the deaths, end quote. So, obviously, none of this makes even the slightest sense. For his movie alibi to work, he'd need a ticket stub or something to prove that he was actually there. If he was at work, there would have to be some evidence to prove he was actually there in order for the alibi to hold up, and especially at the time of the shootings. And if he actually found his wife dead from a gunshot wound in their home, one, why would you handle the gun? And two, why would you leave? The 38 caliber gun found in the home did belong to Robert Spangler, and like I said, because he claimed he handled it after discovering his wife, it made sense that there would be fingerprints belonging to him on the gun. But again, none of these versions make any sense at all. He's such an unbelievable liar, and his story changed significantly multiple times, so I can't for the life of me figure out how police weren't able to zero in on him as the killer and charge him. Granted, there was some manipulation of the crime scene by Robert Spangler that did make it difficult for police to actually prove with evidence that he was the one responsible. Spangler set the crime scene up so that it looked like Nancy shot and killed her children and then turned the gun on herself in a murder-suicide deal and then left the suicide note there as well. And because of that evidence, on January 3rd, 1979, authorities had no choice but to rule that that was what happened. So as ridiculous as it is, Spangler actually got away with it for a time being. Decades later, Spangler would reveal that the night before the murders, he and Nancy had had a conversation about their marriage and divorce was discussed. The following morning, he, quote, lured his wife, Nancy Spangler, down into the basement of their home in Littleton, Colorado. He was clever and used the promise of a surprise. Nancy was hoping for some good news. He then shot her in the head with a 38 handgun, end quote. Less than seven months after the murders, Robert Spangler married his longtime mistress, Sharon Cooper, on July 14, 1979. They spent a lot of their time hiking in the Grand Canyon, a hobby that he would share 
with not only Sharon, but future wife Donna Sunling. But after a few years, Sharon and Robert began to have problems. In 1986, Robert went to visit his elderly father, 92-year-old Merlin Spangler, who suspiciously suffered, quote, a terrible fall a few days after Robert Spangler's arrival and died two weeks later, end quote. After the death of his father, Spangler inherited his father's money and chose to retire. Even though his father isn't usually included in his death count, I'm going to go ahead and say that Merlin Spangler wouldn't have died that suddenly if his son hadn't had something to do with it. So, calling it out right there, Robert Spangler most likely also murdered his father Merlin. In December 1987, Robert and Sharon's marriage was starting to turn violent. At one point, Sharon called the police and ran to a nearby grocery store in order to get away from Robert because she was so frightened by him. By June 24, 1988, Robert and Sharon Cooper were divorced And in the settlement, the court ruled that, quote, Robert must pay Sharon $500 per month for three years and then $400 per month for seven years after that. He also had to give her an immediate $150,000, end quote. So that just shows you right there what kind of money he inherited from his father. Just months after the divorce, Spangler began placing personal ads in the newspapers looking for a new wife. Unfortunately, Donna Sunling saw the ad and contacted Spangler. The connection was immediate, and less than two years later, Donna and Robert were married on August 18, 1990. They bought a home in Durango, Colorado, and to Donna, it seemed like a dream come true. Her new husband was a popular morning DJ for a country music station. They both enjoyed hiking, especially in the Grand Canyon. She was active. She worked as an aerobics instructor, but she felt like she was finally starting the second part of her life. She had a husband now who loved her, that she loved. She had five wonderful children from a previous relationship. She was a proud grandmother. But unfortunately, wedded bliss would be short-lived. On April 11, 1993, Robert Spangler, now 60 years old, and 58-year-old Donna were backpacking through the Grand Canyon. Their marriage had been having issues. It was slowly falling apart, but they decided to go back to an activity that they both bonded over and loved, which was hiking through the Grand Canyon. That morning, Spangler, quote, appeared at a ranger station in the Grand Canyon and calmly told the ranger that his wife had fallen to her death. He explained that they had stopped to take a picture on the trail, and when he looked back, his wife was gone, end quote. A search was immediately initiated, and park rangers located his wife soon after at the bottom of a cliff, about 140 feet down from where Spangler said they had stopped. Donna had multiple devastating injuries, quote, including abrasions, contusions, lacerations, and multiple fractures of the neck, chest, and lower extremities, end quote. Initially, he wasn't suspected of her death. Why would he be? There was not really much to go on, but what I do find interesting about that quote that I read was that he told the park ranger that his wife had fallen to her death. Not that she had fallen, but that she had fallen to her death. There was, however, some suspicion from Donna's family. Despite Donna being very athletic and agile, she was openly afraid of heights. She didn't hide it. People knew, so it didn't make any sense to any of her family members as to why she would be standing so close to the edge of a very high cliff. For someone who's as afraid of heights like she is, why are you standing that close when there's no bar, there's no railing, there's nothing to keep you from falling over the edge? And after her death, Donna's cousin Shirley Dixon recalled how Spangler, quote, had her cremated before her mother even got there, end quote. And this was no doubt to destroy any potential evidence on her body that could have been indicative of foul play. And the tragic death only got more and more national attention as Spangler became obsessed with the attention that it gave him. He did multiple interviews. He participated on TV talk shows, talking about his wife's accidental fall and how people should be careful while hiking in the Grand Canyon. This didn't stop him from going back to hike. However, 
after her death, he eventually started dating again, and sometimes he would take new romantic partners with him to the Grand Canyon. Spangler also allegedly reached back out to his second wife, Sharon, and reignited a relationship with her. Now, keep in mind, he was still required to pay Sharon her alimony during this time. Eventually, in the summer of 1994, Sharon came to Spangler's home for a visit. He had offered to host her there while she got over a recent breakup with her boyfriend, as well as the death of her dog. Sharon had also developed a drug problem. And on October 2nd, 1994, Spangler claimed he found Sharon unconscious from a suspected overdose and took her to the emergency room. Spangler apparently stayed with her in her room at the hospital, being very attentive, not leaving her side. And despite being stabilized after the overdose, Sharon died. At the time, Robert Spangler was the only person in the room with her when she passed. And with her death, he was no longer obligated to pay the alimony, and he also received a $20,000 payout from Sharon's insurance policy. So now that Sharon was dead, Robert no longer had to pay her any evidence as to Sharon's knowledge of his first wife and children's murders died with her. And once again, when Robert was questioned by police about her death, nothing was done. No evidence was solid enough to consider him a suspect. So he basically walked away free. About a year later, FBI investigators Paul Goodman and Bev Perry began looking into Donna's death because they knew deep down something didn't quite add up with his story and what actually happened. By January 1999, investigators from the U.S. Department of Interior, the counties of Coconino, Arizona, and Arapahoe, Colorado, as well as the National Park Service, all joined together and began looking into Robert Spangler's background, gathering whatever information they could find about him. During this time, Spangler quit his job, sold his home, and decided to move to Pennsylvania. He had met a woman over the internet and moved there to be closer to her, but according to her, quote, she was taken aback by his intensity and their relationship did not work out, end quote. And since there was no reason for Spangler to stay in Pennsylvania... He moved back to Grand Junction, Colorado, where he had landed a job as the vice president of the Applecrest Irrigation Company. Also in his spare time, he participated in local theater. As different authorities were looking into Robert Spangler, they also decided to put him under surveillance, especially when he'd make trips to the Grand Canyon with his new girlfriend, Judy Hilty. What Spangler didn't know is that not only were authorities closing in on him as the prime suspect, but he was also terminally ill. Spangler had been cast as John Hancock in a dinner theater production of 1776 during the summer of 1999, but he noticed that he had a lot of difficulty remembering his lines. He went to his primary doctor, who recommended a few follow-up tests. Spangler would soon be diagnosed with an inoperable tumor in his lung on August 12, 2000, and that the cancer had metastasized to his brain, so Spangler's days were significantly numbered. Upon learning this information, Robert and Judy decided to get married and exchange vows on September 1st, but as the police continued to monitor the situation, they became concerned about Judy, wondering if Spangler would try to murder his new wife. Knowing that he was terminally ill also put additional pressure on the investigation. All of the investigating, all of the surveillance, everything like that, the entire task force basically that they had set up to look at Spangler, if he died before they got their answers, the last several years would have been for nothing. Just two weeks after Robert and Judy were married, investigators decided to try one more time. They decided to bring him in for questioning and told him that if he had anything he wanted to get off his chest, now was the time. Initially, Spangler was hesitant. He didn't understand why FBI profilers wanted to talk to him until they explained that, quote, only serial killers are interviewed by profilers, end quote. 
This, of course, piqued his interest because he is a narcissist to the umpteenth degree. And as they questioned him about the 1978 slaughter of his family, as well as the deaths of Donna and Sharon, he played on his medical condition a bit and claimed that they were asking him far too many different things to remember and he couldn't handle it. So he left. But shortly after he left this first interview, he called one of the FBI agents the following morning to see about continuing the interview. So during part two, Spangler began to confess. He told the investigators, quote, how while married to his first wife, he fell in love with another woman, then shot his wife and his two teenage children to be with her. Further, Spangler said he smothered his son with a pillow after shooting him because the bullet wound was not lethal. He strongly denied involvement in the overdose death of his second wife and refused to discuss the death in the Grand Canyon because he feared a civil lawsuit from his third wife's grown children, end quote. A confession to Donna's murder at the Grand Canyon was the primary goal, and they did consider his confession to the 1978 murders a win. But ultimately, authorities recognized that Spangler wanted the infamy that went along with being labeled a serial killer. So they told him that just because he killed more than one person at the same time didn't mean he was a serial killer. Spangler looked up and said, quote, you've got your cereal, end quote. He then went on to explain how he had planned the murder of his wife, Donna, waiting until they were close to the edge of a cliff and pushing her off when she turned to face him. And that's just completely freaking horrible because you know they made eye contact as he shoved her. So the last thing she saw before she fell to the ground was the cold, savage, empty eyes of a psychotic man who she thought loved her, pushing her to her death. After his confession, Spangler was shockingly concerned about his reputation. He was popular in the community. He had been a well-liked radio personality, so he actually sent one of the FBI agents a letter begging them to minimize the case's publicity and stating, quote, that he was not like other serial killers who target people for race or sexual orientation, correctly assessing that some serial killers target groups they perceive as undesirable. Spangler's motivation to kill centered around the anticipated gain of eliminating his wives and children, end quote. He also apparently said during one of his interviews that killing his wives was easier than getting a divorce. And when the news broke, to not only the victims' families, who some had suspected him all along, some were shocked, but also to friends. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Not only did he kill these women and his two children, but he had told everyone different versions of the stories, and none of them had noticed or compared notes. I mean, why would you compare notes, I guess, really. Why would you compare stories? It's so horrible. You don't speak about it more often than you need to. And for example, he told Lori Lacey, who was a fellow soccer referee with Spangler, that his first wife, Nancy, had committed suicide. He said his daughter, Susan, had overdosed on heroin and that David had been killed in a car accident. Some of the actors in the dinner theater had been told one of his wives died of cancer. Even his new wife, Judy, was baffled at the confession to the point where she told a neighbor she felt duped and completely numb. Shortly after his confession, Spangler was, quote, indicted by a federal grand jury in Phoenix in the 1993 death of Donna Sundling Spangler, end quote. He was also, quote, charged in Colorado with murdering his first wife and two children, because according to prosecutors, he was dissatisfied with family life, end quote. Robert Spangler, charged with first-degree murder of Donna, initially pled not guilty on November 5th, 2000. He later stated that, quote, his brain cancer had caused him to confess to things he had not done, end quote. But he would end up eventually pleading guilty and signing a plea agreement in federal district court in Arizona, to serve life in prison with no chance of parole for Donna's murder. And because he confessed to the murders of 
Nancy and Susan and David. He was charged, but he was never convicted of those. I don't think he even went to trial for those. And I think at that point, authorities were just satisfied that he was behind bars and he had finally confessed to ruining so many lives. Robert Spangler would serve less than one year in prison, dying of cancer on August 5th, 2001 at 3.15 a.m. at the Springfield, Missouri Federal Corrections Medical Center. Well, okay then, friends, that was Robert Spangler, the Black Widower serial killer. This case is so unbelievably infuriating because at least at three different points, well, four, if you include his father, he was responsible or at least very highly suspected of murder or foul play in the deaths of a significant other or family member. And for one reason or another, either there wasn't enough evidence or there was some kind of half-assed, almost mostly believable alibi that allowed him to slip by without facing the fire. It wasn't until he was dying of cancer and was presented with the opportunity to make a name for himself. It wasn't even that he wanted to get it off his chest because he felt guilty. He wanted to live in infamy. He wanted to be labeled a serial killer and was given this opportunity. So he felt compelled to confess. He is a family annihilator and I hate family annihilators. I think they are I don't like any of the killers that I cover, but family annihilators really hit a nerve with me because you, there are so many of them. And recently they feel like, I feel like they popped up a lot more. We hear all the time about Chris Watts. There's Anthony Todd. There's Mark Gago. There's so many different, and it's not just men. There are also female family annihilators out there too, but with them, the decision is rarely spontaneous. They don't just snap and decide to kill their family. There's usually a reason for it. Spangler committed his first murders because he fell in love with Sharon and needed his family out of the picture. He no longer wanted to be responsible for his wife or to his children, which is basically the same story as Chris Watts, who murdered his pregnant wife and little girls while having an affair and wanted a, quote, fresh start. What's interesting, or not interesting, it's all infuriating, but I guess what is trending among family annihilators is that they tend to commit these murders when the children are not in school. Spangler committed his murders over the holiday break in December 1978 when children are not in school, when the kids wouldn't have been in school. Chris Watts, committed his murders in August 2018. And the reason for this, which I'm sure you can figure out, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway, is that he committed these murders when there was no expectation for the children to be seen the very next day. So even though in Spangler's case, his family was discovered dead the following day, it gives him a little more leeway, a little more freedom in terms of time and discovery instead of doing it when school is in session and having the schools wondering where the children are and then an investigation gets launched that way. According to an article titled Men Who Murder Their Families, what the research tells us, quote, 90% of the time, the best predictor of domestic violence is past behavior, end quote. So the fact that Sharon Cooper called the police at least once during their marriage because she was frightened of Robert Spangler is evidence right there that Spangler was capable of violent behavior and realistically I'd suspect that he behaved violently in each of his marriages. So Robert Spangler, liar, serial killer, family annihilator, I hope it's hot enough down there for you. All right. Thank you all so much for listening. I say it every week, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate you turning in each week. It means so much. 
every week I receive words of encouragement, of support, people supporting the show, people telling people about the show. And I hope that you'll continue to listen week in and week out for as long as I can keep this up. And for me, it's really weird to say I hope you enjoy the episodes, but I do. I hope that you're learning something. I'm hoping that I'm presenting you with cases that you aren't as familiar with. That's why I tend to choose the ones that I do because I don't know that much about them and I want to learn more. So I hope that's helping you in the same way that it's helping me. As always, you can reach out to Mask of Sanity on any of the social medias. The Instagram is Mask of Sanity the Podcast. Twitter is Mask Sanity Pod. The Facebook page is Mask of Sanity the Podcast. You can also email me, Mask of Sanity the Podcast at gmail.com for any questions, suggestions, feedback, anything like that. Please also go into my episode notes and click on the link for the Oracle Network. Check that out. We have a lot of amazing shows, and my promo trailer today is actually for the Oracle Network's podcast of the month for November, Not Your Normal Murder. The show is hosted by sisters Mary and Deirdre, and they walk listeners through true crime cases and draw on their own personal knowledge of the criminal justice system and mental health. So definitely give them a listen, rate, review, subscribe. If you're looking for ways to support Mask of Sanity, I have a Patreon, a merch store, a coffee account. Any of those links can be found on my Linktree link that is in any of my social media bios. And again, just thank you all so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week when I cover the case of Audrey Marie Hilly. Until next time, stay safe, friends. Mask of Sanity is partnered with the Oracle Network. The Menendez brothers. We are talking about Pamela Smart, Andrea Yates. I think that is kind of one of the first things that started my true crime obsession. We're definitely going to be diving into the legal and psychological parts of this case. First of all, you shouldn't be friends with people that ask you to cut up somebody's body. And on the flip side, you shouldn't be friends with somebody who is willing to cut up somebody's body. If she is abusing drugs at 9 and 12 years old, it would make sense that there was some significant abuse going on in the house. That's not normal. Never trust the mother or the lover. Who is a self-professed drug dealer in court? That's why we always say get a lawyer, because you just fed them this information that they didn't have and they're now using it against you hi everybody my name's mary and i'm deirdre and we're from not your normal murder podcast with my experience in psychiatry and my experience in criminal justice we bring a fresh perspective on small town cases and those cases you can't forget if you love true crime a little bit of sarcastic banner but lots of objective research come find us on apple podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts you know what's the best part of hump day there's a new episode every wednesday see you there thanks again for listening to true crime by indie drop-in if you would like your show featured reach out to us at indie drop-in on all social media or go to indie see you next time